All right, so keep your place in Jeremiah 13 because we're going to be going back and forth. So put a bookmark there, and we're going to be coming to Jeremiah 13 uh, throughout the entire sermon. So tonight we're going to talk about, we started um, our Jeremiah series with the calling of Jeremiah. Tonight we're going to talk about the message of Jeremiah. And it's a lot, you know, to cover in one sermon, you know, the message of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is an interesting book. It's one of the longest um, of the major prophets. Um, in the Bible, Jeremiah has um, a lot to say in uh, the chapters that are about Jeremiah. Jeremiah also um, wrote the book of Lamentations. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little, a little bit more, Lamentations, in later sermons on Jeremiah. But for tonight, we're going to focus on the message of Jeremiah. So turn back to Jeremiah chapter 1, if you would. Jeremiah chapter 1. Now let's just look back at the beginning of what God told Jeremiah that he was going to be, because God kind of summarized Jeremiah's message. Let's look at what God's summary said, and then let's just kind of step through, you know, why God gave that command and that summary of Jeremiah's message. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse number 10. This is, of course, Jeremiah chapter 1 is about the calling of Jeremiah when God calls him. And in Jeremiah 1.10, the Bible says, See, I have this day set thee over nations and over kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. So here we see that Jeremiah was to do all these things. This was what his, this is basically a nice little summary of what the purpose of Jeremiah's message was. Right here in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse number 10. And most of it doesn't sound very pleasant, right? But look, it starts out with this idea that Jeremiah is to root out. He's to root out. So, I mean, what does that, what does that mean? I mean, root out, root out what? Turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. You know, I mean, did, you know, what, what's, he, what's he looking for? What's he trying to dig up here? I mean, uh, did God, you know, do something wrong? I mean, what's, what's the problem, right? So look at Jeremiah 2 and verse number 5 to just come out and look at this idea of rooting out and what Jeremiah was to root out. Look at Jeremiah 2 and verse number, and verse number 5 where the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? So God's saying, what did I do wrong? God's saying, what did I do wrong where your fathers, you know, they've gone away from me? They've gone far from me. And then look at verse number 13. God basically lays it out. He lays out the issue with these people with two problems. In verse 13, He says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. So first of all, what did they do? They forsook the Lord. That's the first thing that they did wrong. They forsook God. They turned away from God. And then what is the next thing that they did? They did? It's not only that they turned away from God, but they replaced God which is even worse. It's not like they just turned away from God into nothingness. It says that they hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns. Turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. If you go into the back of the Old Testament, you'll get into those minor prophets. You'll have Micah, Nahum, and you'll have Habakkuk. Go to Habakkuk and look at chapter number 2. So, I mean, I like how you know, God puts it in Jeremiah 2.13 where He says, you know, they hewed out cisterns. But these cisterns, they're broken cisterns. And they can't even, you know, a cistern, we actually had a cistern on the farm. It's basically an underground concrete tank. So the well, it pumps water into this underground tank, and it's water storage is what the cistern is. So it's like they hewed out these cisterns, but they're broken. So what good is a cistern that they can't hold water? It's worthless, right? It's no good at all. Look at Habakkuk chapter 2. In verse number 18, where the Bible says, What profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it? The molten image and a teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols. Woe unto him that saith to the wood, Awake, to the dumb stone arise, it shall teach. 
Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. So it's saying, you know, these idols, they're making these idols of wood and gold and silver, and, and they're just dumb idols. They're just, it can't teach you anything. It, it can't do any, it's just, a, it's just a piece of wood. It's just a piece of gold or silver or whatever. I mean, they're just, so like, God is like, He's watching this, and they've not only forsaken Him, but they've forsaken Him for all these dumb idols that are nothing. God, I mean, God just like face palm, right? I mean, He's like, what are they doing? There's just, you know, they forsook Him for all these things that are they're just nothingness. Okay, but what do we know about God from this morning? God is jealous, right? God is a jealous God. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. Look at verse number 32 of Jeremiah chapter 2. So we're rooting out the problem. We're finding out, you know, what's the issue here, right? Well, it gets even worse. So we see that, you know, they forsook the Lord and then they replaced the Lord. I mean, it's like trading in a Ferrari for like a, a broken down, you know, car that doesn't even run, right? I mean, it, it's not even a good comparison. But it, it just, they, they made a bad trade here. <laughs> is what they did, okay? Look at Jeremiah 2 and verse 32. The Bible says, Can a maid forget her ornaments, or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. So look, this is what he's saying. He's saying, this didn't just happen yesterday. This has been going on for days without number, he says. You know, the coming chapters talk about you know, the nation compared to a woman who plays the harlot against her husband and all these different things. They basically just stab God in the back. They just, you know, they're, they're having, you know, an adulterous relationship with all these dumb idols is basically what the coming chapters talk about in Jeremiah. Okay? So, next, so he roots out the problem. He, we see that that's the issue. They've abandoned God and they've abandoned Him for all these false gods, basically. Okay? They made a bad trade. So what's he supposed to do next? Jeremiah is supposed to pull down and destroy, the Bible says. So look, Jeremiah's message was, you know, go to Jeremiah 13. Let's talk about the girdle. The girdle of Jeremiah chapter 13. I, I love this, I love this uh, analogy in the Bible that God uses here um, with Jeremiah. But basically, Jeremiah's message was, was harsh. It was not a nice message for the, for the most part. In Jeremiah 13, we see this analogy of the girdle. And in Jeremiah 13, look at verse number 7. The Bible says, so God has him take this girdle, which is a, is a belt, okay? It's a belt. It's something that's worn around your waist. I don't know what a girdle means today, but that's what it meant in, in the Bible. It's a belt that goes around your entire body. And God tells him, you know, take this girdle, go and bury it down by the river, which is like in the dirt and the mud. So he goes and he buries it under a rock for many days. And then verse 7 it says, Then I went to Euphrates and digged, and I took the girdle from the place where I had hid it. And behold, the girdle was marred, and it was profitable for nothing. So imagine this nice you know, velvet, white belt or whatever that you take and you go and you bury it in the mud for, you know, weeks on end or whatever. And then you go and you just, you dig it up and it's, it's ruined. Right? It's ruined. It's good for nothing. In verse number 8, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, So God's, God's giving an object lesson here. And I, I like object lessons, so I, I like these types of things in the Bible. But it says, Thus saith the Lord, After this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people, which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods, we've already rooted that out, to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle which is good for nothing. Look at verse 11. Now we see why he uses the girdle as an example. For as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so I have caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory. So that's a positive statement right there. God wants the house of Israel and the house of Judah, who specifically is who we're talking about, He wants them to be around Him like a belt. 
Now, are belts like loosely hanging? I'm not talking about belts the way people wear them now. A normal human that wears a belt is supposed to be tight and snug around your whole body. So they, he's using this example of the kingdom of Judah, the house of Israel. This was the design. This was God's design, is that his people would cleave to him like a belt, tightly to the Lord. The Lord is the person, not the belt. The girdle is the, is, the, is the house of Israel, is the nation of Israel, is the nation of Judah. And they're supposed to cleave to him like a belt. And now they're just this worthless, dirt-covered, rotted piece of whatever, is why he's using this example. And in the last part of verse 11, he says, so he says this very positive statement. They're supposed to be to me like a girdle just cleaving around me. Right? That shows how people should wear their belts today, their pants. Amen. Right? Amen. It's, in, it's biblical. Right. All right? But then he says what? He says, but they would not hear, he says. So look, you know, Judah was the girdle, and they were supposed to be cleaving to the Lord, but they, instead they were good for nothing. They were as good as a, as a marred belt. Now look, you have to understand some things about the history of Jeremiah. Jeremiah started out his ministry, his prophetic ministry, during the time of Josiah. Turn to Jeremiah 13, where we started. He started out during the, the, you know, the reign of King Josiah, which he did some good things. Josiah, I mean, there was, there was a revival there. Josiah found the book of the law, and he, he threw down some idols, and he threw down the false prophets, and the, 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 you know, he pulled the bones of the false prophets out of the graves and smashed them on the altars. I mean, there was some revival that Josiah put into place. But we get a little bit of vision of what actually happened with the nation in Jeremiah. Look at verse number 23, it's, or look at your bulletin. It's the, it's the verse of the week. He says in Jeremiah 13, 23, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to evil. Look, remember in chapter 2, it, it says that they left him, and it, it, it's been days without number. So the revival of Josiah, it, it did not capture the heart of the nation, is what Jeremiah is saying here. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 23. So, Josiah did some good things. He enacted some good laws, but the heart of the nation was already, it was, it was gone. In Jeremiah, he says, the Ethiopian, I mean, you can't change your skin color. I mean, unless you get sunburned. I mean, but that's not the point. He's saying that, hey, certain people have certain skin colors, and that's just the way they're born, that's the way they are, that's the way it is. The leopard, can a leopard make himself not have spots? No, I mean, God is basically saying, you know what? I mean, and that's a hard, is a harsh statement that God is saying. Because actually, people could decide not to be evil. A nation could decide not to be evil. But God is like, you know what? It's been so long. You've been serving other gods so long that it's like, you know what? You're never going to turn from your evil ways. It's done, is what he's saying. He's like, you're done. And here's another thing. Even if they did turn from their evil ways, look at 2 Kings 23 and verse 26. The Bible says this. It says, look... Here's another thing. 2 Kings 23, look at verse 26. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah. This is after Josiah did all these great things. He says, nevertheless, you know, notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked withal. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah out of this site as I have removed Israel and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which, which I have chosen, and the house which I said, my name shall be here. All he said to Josiah, because Josiah did all those things, all he said to Josiah was, you know what, I'm not going to do it in your lifetime. Because he did these great things, I'm not doing it in your lifetime. But the decision was already made. The decision was already made because what the nation had done already under Manasseh, which was, you know, the sacrifice of children. Under Manasseh, amongst an, all sorts of other violence. Okay, so look, if I ever start my own nation, 
Here's what people, and if you're ever planning on starting your own nation, here's a big one that you can't miss, okay? It doesn't matter, you gotta like write this in your constitution in, in like the top paragraph or something. If you go down a road and commit evil, you're going to pay for that evil. God's gonna judge it. It doesn't matter if there's a great revival and all these kind. I mean, that's good. Revival is good. If we turn to the Lord, if, if Judah turned back to the Lord, that would be good. But they're still going to pay for what they did. I mean, God's the perfect judge. And He's going to judge. So ultimately, you know, ultimately, no matter what happens, not that I think that there will be some revival in this country, but we're in trouble in this country. I mean, we could have the revival of, of all times, but we can't undo what's already been done. That's the problem. We can't undo, you know, 60 million innocent lives that we've murdered legally in this country. I mean, that can't be undone. We're going to pay for that. Yeah. We're going to pay for that. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 13. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 13 and look at verse number 26. So when you, when you, when you go off and start your own nation, you gotta, you got to put that clause in there somewhere that, you know what, hey, if, if we even mess up for a few years, we're going to pay for that. Remember, asterisk, bold, footnote, something. Put that somewhere. Okay? Jeremiah 13, look at verse number 26. Therefore will I discover thy skirts upon thy face, that thy shame may appear. He's, he's using this analogy of your skirt upon your face. You know, you're, you're exposing your nakedness, and, and you're, it's a shameful thing. He said, you're going to be shamed. I have seen thine adulteries and thy nays, the lewdness of thy whoredom, and thy abominations on the hills and the fields. Woe unto thee, O Jerusalem! Wilt thou not be made clean? When shall it once be? We cannot, well, look, we cannot undo the lewdness that has already happened in this country that's been accepted and all of this kind of stuff. Now, back to Jeremiah. So we see that this was coming. This was coming, no matter what. They could have, they could have listened to Jeremiah. They could have, you know, listened to Jeremiah and, and just, well, whoa, you know, but look, it was coming because of the sins that had already been committed by the nation. Look at Jeremiah 13, verse 12, just a few verses back. The Bible says this, it says, Therefore thou shalt speak unto them this word. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Every bottle shall be filled with wine. And they shall say unto thee, Do we not certainly know that every bottle shall be filled with wine? Look, this is the nice neighborhood that you go soul winning in. Right here. Okay? Then thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the kings that sit upon David's throne, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with drunkenness. And I will dash them one against another. Even the fathers and the sons together, saith the Lord, I will not pity, nor spare, nor have mercy, but destroy them. Look, he's saying, I'm going to give them, you know, I mean, we go and we talk to people and they're like, oh, everything's great. Our bottles are filled with wine. Everything's wonderful. We have, we have wine in abundance and we have all these things. And God says, I'm going to give all that stuff to them. And they're going to be comfortable. They're going to have all this liquid courage in them. And then I'm going to dash them to pieces. Father against son. <clears throat> they will think nothing is wrong. And they certainly won't listen to somebody that's giving a message like Jeremiah was giving a message. And that's why, frankly, people that are very comfortable in nice neighborhoods and all this type of stuff and very comfortable in their American life are going to have a very hard time listening to you when you go out and you, you give the gospel. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But now, let's talk about the last part of Jeremiah's message, which is this, which is to throw down. Now we're talking about taking it up a notch. To throw down. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 26. Jeremiah chapter 26. So he's preaching this message that, you know, they've left the Lord. They've left the Lord and they've worshipped other gods and God is going to, you know, dash them one against another. And he's preaching this, you know, this very harsh message. But then he takes it up a notch. You say, how could he take it up a notch? 
Well, I don't know. How about going in the temple, standing in the temple, and saying that your enemies are going to destroy this very place? How about that? Look at Jeremiah 26 and verse number 1. Now this is under King Jehoiakim, which is the king, the very first king who got invaded by the Babylonian Empire. And this is talking about, this is basically the beginning of the end right here for the nation of Judah. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house. So he's saying, he's saying, Go stand in the temple, and speak these words. If, they, if, if so be that they hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. And thou shalt say to them, Thus saith the Lord, If ye will not hearken to me to walk in my law which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of the servants, the prophets, whom I sent to you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened, then I will make this house like Shiloh and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. So the priests, I mean, do you think that that made people happy? So Shiloh has been destroyed hundreds of years ago. Hundreds of years ago. And he's saying this house is going to be made like this city that's been destroyed. And this house is going to be a curse unto the nations. And then I will make, and so the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. So look, he's basically standing in the temple saying God's going to destroy this place, and they, they, he makes people so mad that they literally want to kill him for it. All right? So that, I mean, that is, that, he's, now he's throwing it down. So look, we, we see that during Josiah's reign, there were some good things that happened. Josiah knocked down some idols. He enacted some proper laws. But the nation did not change their heart towards the Lord, which is where Jeremiah comes in. Comes in. And ultimately, I'll just read it for you. In 2 Kings 23, the Bible says that notwithstanding the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight as I have removed Israel. They're already gone. The nation of Israel's already gone. He's saying, I'm going to remove Judah. And I will cast off this city Jerusalem which I have chosen and the house which I said my name shall be here. So, I mean, God said that he was going to destroy the house in 2 Kings 23. Jeremiah is just repeating it to the people's faces in the house. All right? So God's mind was made up. He was going to punish them for past sins. So, you say, what is the point of Jeremiah? If God's mind was made up, like Josiah did some things, but God had already decided, then, then what's, what's the point? If God was already going to destroy Judah in 2 Kings 23, Babylon was going to come in, they were going to destroy the whole temple, you know, why send Jeremiah? Why the message? And, why the prophets, for, for that matter, is the question. And, and there's, there's two reasons. And the first one is this. Number one, it's, it's to explain to the people why it happened. All right? To give the people an answer of, of why God did this. You know, to be a witness to just explain, hey, this is why God is doing this. Right? I mean, look. We, we can look at, at things, and, and some people will, will disagree on, okay, is this the judgment of God? Is this the judgment of God? Was that fire or earthquake or whatever, the judgment of God? People can disagree on that, but here's the thing. Looking back on things, we will all agree what the judgment of God was. Looking back. When they stood it, you know, in the rubble of the temple... They could look back and they could say, remember that guy that stood in the temple and told us that this was going to happen? I mean, that's the mark of a true prophet right there, that the things actually come, to, come true. So that's the first thing. Just so, so people would understand, looking back, what had happened. 
And I mean, why, why, is, it, why is it important look, to look back and, and know what happened? That, that brings to the second point of the prophets, and that's so people know how to rebuild. So people know how to rebuild. Turn to Jeremiah 26 and look at verse number 23. Because one thing that you'll notice about most of the harsh statements of Jeremiah is they all kind of come with this, you know, this rebuild clause. And if you look at chapter 26 and verse number 13, the Bible says, Therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will what? He will repent him of the evil that he pronounced against you. Turn to Jeremiah 33. Look, God, God not only tells them, He tells Jeremiah to throw down, to destroy and do all this, but look, He's also there to show them what they need to do to rebuild. Look at Jeremiah 33 and verse number 4. And the Bible says this, it says, For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the house of this city, and concerning the house, houses of the kings of Judah, which are thrown down. It, it's, it's already done. They're already thrown down by the mounts and by the sword. They come to fight with the Chaldeans, but it is to fill them with the dead bodies of men, who I have slain in my anger and in my fury, and for all whose wickedness I have hid my face from this city. So God... He literally says here that when the Babylonians came in and they were killing all these people, God just hid His face from them. They did not have the protection of the Lord. God, I mean, all it takes is for... God, God doesn't have to send an angel to judge a nation. All He has to do is hide His face from a nation. And then all these wicked nations will just come in and they'll just run roughshod over everything. And that's what God did here. But look in verse number 6. Verse number 6, it says, Behold, I will bring it health and cure, and I will cure them. And I will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. And I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return, and will build them as at the first. So he's saying, repent, and this is what I'll do. I will rebuild you. And after the captivity, this is what happened. They look. They spiritually rebuilt themselves before they were allowed to physically rebuild. And that's what happened. And it came true. After 70 years of captivity, they had a spiritual revival. And they went back and they physically built the city and they physically built the temple. That's Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel's temple. That's the whole story of those men is the return from exile and that spiritual revival. So Jeremiah's message, I mean, it was pretty simple. He was to root out the problem. He was to, to tear down, to destroy, you know, what was currently happening, to throw down what was currently happening, and then he was to show them how to rebuild. Now you say, what is the application for us today, you know, with this story uh, of Jeremiah? But, I mean, think about soul winning. Think about being out soul winning. You know, the first part, look, the first part of addressing any problem is identifying the fault. Identifying, look, the first part of addressing any issue is identifying the problem, right? So what, what, what are the, why do we ask these questions? You know, why do we go up to somebody and ask the question, hey, do you know for sure if you died today, if you would go to heaven? Because we're trying to root out what, what the issue is with them. We're trying to find out if there's a problem. Is there a problem? Do they not know? Do they, do they think they know and they're trusting in something wrong? Are they trusting in a broken cistern? We're trying to figure out what's going on with these people, right? So look, look that's why I like to use, when I'm out soul winning, that's why I've told you guys before, I like to use people's own words. I like to have people tell me what they would tell, you know, hey, if I was your friend, what would you tell me it takes to get to heaven? And then I just listen to what they say. Because now they'll tell you what, if their cistern holds water or not. So we can root out, you know, those answers. You know, and then, look, for 99% of people out there, or whatever that percentage is, the vast majority of people, there's going to have to be some tearing down involved in a nice way, in a nicer way than Jeremiah, hopefully. But we have to, you know, 
it may be hard for people to hear. You have to understand that. It may be hard for people to hear that, you know what, their cistern is not, it's not going to hold any water. But that's where we use God's word to show people, you know, what is true and what is not. And th this can be challenging, especially today, with all these weird beliefs that are out there, with all this different twisting of doctrine that is out there. You need to have a little bit of command of the Bible to be good at this. The, the stranger things get, the more strange things you're going to hear out soul winning. But we have to tear these things down. And look, this is the thing that you will notice. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is the thing that you will notice about Jeremiah's message. Jeremiah was arguably one of the most negative prophets out there. Amen. Look at Jeremiah, or I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and look at verse number 1. I mean, there wasn't a lot of positivity that he was saying. Anything that he said positive was basically, you know, going to happen after they've already gone through all these bad things, right? But look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1. The Bible says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers and having itching ears, they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. Look, this, these were the people in Jeremiah's time, and this, these are the people that we're going to deal with today. Yeah. They, they don't, you know, a lot of, look, some people do want to hear the truth. That's why we're out there, right? But a lot of people don't want to hear the truth. They're, they're, their cup is full, just go away, my cup is full. I mean, they literally wanted, I mean, they wanted to kill Jeremiah. I mean, they threw him in prison. They wanted to kill him. There's all kinds of people, you know, after his life. And, you know, I mean, imagine his message. If you think, you know, you had a bad day out soul winning ever, just think about Jeremiah's message. I mean, they're basically, they're being threatened by a foreign nation. And here's this guy going around, you know, they, they're, they're pretty sure they're going to get invaded. I mean, they've heard of Babylon. Hezekiah knew about Babylon. Right? And look, they, they're, they're pretty sure they're going to get invaded at some point, and this guy's going around saying, hey, we're going to lose. <laughs> I mean, America. Right? I mean, he's going around saying, it's like, it's like the North Koreans or the Chinese are threatening us, and we're thinking we might be invaded. It's like some guy running around the country saying, we're going to lose. We're going to lose. I mean, how popular do you think that that, that guy would be? You know, they're going to win. You know what? But here's the thing. Negative messages will never be received well by the masses. Why do you think that the politician who promises the most gets elected? I mean, it's just a game. Who can promise the most stuff to people at this point? That's what it is. I mean, that, but that's why God told Jeremiah in chapter number one, it's like, be not afraid of their faces. Because God was preparing, God knew that they weren't going to like what Jeremiah was going to say. But look, with all the negative messaging also came this. Turn back to Jeremiah 29. With all the negative messaging of Jeremiah also came this, and it applies to us today. In Jeremiah 29, look at verse number 12. And this is just great because it explains, God's telling them what's going to happen. He's telling them what's going to happen to them. And he says in verse 12, Then ye shall call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. There's that spiritual revival right there. God is explaining to them that they're going to have a spiritual revival. And that was part of Jeremiah's message. This is the, this is the rebuilding. This is the building part. And ye shall seek me and find me. But what? Because he says you should seek me and find me no matter what. No. He says, you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me, what? With all your heart. So he says, when this nation, when you as an individual, from this morning, when you search for the Lord with all your heart, will you find him? Is it maybe? No. For sure. You will find him. When you search for all your heart. I mean, do you want, I mean, 
Is this start, are you starting to get a pattern in the Bible? Like, it's, it's like, all your heart. Trust on. Believe on. It's not 99-1. It's 100 or nothing. I mean, that's, that's what God... I mean, if, if I believe that 99% Jesus, 1% me, I'm going to hell. I mean, it's, it's the same here. The spiritual revival needed to be trust with all your heart. And then you will find me. For sure. It's, it, I mean, that is a, is a statement. You shall seek me and find me. 14. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity. So look, he's telling them, you're going into captivity. But I will turn it away. I'll turn it away. And I will gather you from all the nations and from the places where I've driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. I mean, that all your heart, that's, I mean, that salvation right there, it's the same methodology. It's a picture here of physical salvation of the nation of Judah, but it's also the exact same way someone is spiritually saved. You see? It's a picture for us. So, like Jeremiah, we first, we root out. We tear down. I mean, there's going to be some negativity there. You're going to have to talk to people about hell. Turn to John chapter 4. You know, there's some, I mean, there's some negativity there when, when you go through you know, the gospel with somebody and you have to find out what, you know, what they believe and then you know, tear that down with the Bible. But look at John chapter 4. This is the woman at the well. This is Jesus going up to the Samaritan woman at the well. Look at verse 25. And Jesus is very brief with this lady. See, this lady, she knew that there was a Messiah coming. And she tells Jesus here, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. It's like, it's me. A pretty short gospel presentation right there. It's like, it's me. And upon this came to his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her, her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is this, is not this the Christ? So this woman, you know, believed that Jesus was the Christ. So Jesus, you know, basically he talked to her about a couple things, and then he basically, she said, I know the Messiah is coming. You know, he's, he's talking to her about, you know, living water, basically, is all he really says to her. And then if you drink of li this living water, and she doesn't really understand that, but she's like, I know the Messiah is coming. He's like, it's me. There's his gospel presentation. It's me. But here's the thing. We need to root out. We need to tear down, because we are not Jesus. So don't Preach half the gospel to somebody is what the point I'm trying to make here. We have to start from the beginning because we're not Jesus. We don't know what people believe. We don't know what people believe. And all we really know from what people believe is what they tell us. So that's why we have to root out. And then we have to tear down. Because, look, Jesus just knew where this lady was. He just knew that you know, she knew there was a Messiah and that she, uh, he, she understood what the Messiah was. And he, and he basically said, hey, oh, by the way, you know, all that stuff that you believe that the Messiah is coming, it's me. And she's like, okay, I believe that. Done. We're not Jesus, though. So we have to root out, do some tearing down. You know, but here's the thing. We don't just show people the error of their ways and then just walk away, right? We don't just be like, you know, okay, what do you believe? Okay, okay, all that, all that. Okay, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that, you know, you're a sinner and that this is the wages for your sin and, you know, hell, and it's everlasting. You know, you burn forever. It's everlasting torment. And, I mean, it, it's, it's terrible, right? I mean, so do you believe you're a sinner and you deserve to go to hell, right? You're like, oh, yeah. I mean, Jesus talked about hell a lot. I mean, Jesus was talking about hell all the time. And they're like, oh, yeah, okay, all right, all right, see you later. 
Bye. Okay. And they're all like, what? No, we don't do that. We, now we have some building to do. Amen. Right? But we have, to, we have to tear down first, just like Jeremiah did. Right? Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, one God. So I mean the Bible, I mean the Bible says that you know the captivity will end, right? It's like it doesn't say that there would be no captivity, but the captivity would end. Look at Ephesians 4, 6. One God, the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto everyone is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Just as in Jeremiah when he says, I will turn away your captivity, we are showing people how they can get out of their captivity. It's the same thing. The actual message of Jeremiah is the exact same spiritual message that we carry. You carry the message of Jeremiah every single time that you go out soul winning. You root out, you tear down, you throw down if you have to, in a nice, polite way. But then we must build. And we must show them, look, so I mean, is negative, is negative messaging bad? No. Sometimes there has to be negative message, even from the soul winning tip. You know, even somebody who's not going to accept, you know, Christ in that moment, you know, it's, it's always good to show them that what the difference is that you're showing them from the Bible to what they currently believe is the difference between eternal life or eternal damnation. It's important that people know the truth. I mean, it's necessary because, look, it leads to captivity being, you know, being led captive by Christ in people's lives. To, to salvation, to everlasting life. So once again, I mean, not only is the Old Testament not, it, not only is it relevant today, not only is it true and consistent, but it, it's a perfect, it's a miracle that it's a perfect reflection of, of the message that we carry today, is it not? Amen. I mean, it's a miracle. It's exactly the same message. So that is the message of Jeremiah. It's the same message that you carry today. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.